Yet not I, but through Christ in me. That's how we get through the tough stuff, is it not? So, this morning, uh, I want to talk to you about movie plots to start out. So, when you look at a movie, when you watch a movie, one of the things, the pattern that is across pretty much every storyline, every movie, is typically things are going well, there are successes, but then there has to be some sort of a failure in the storyline before the ultimate success. There's always something where everything looks like it's going up and to the right, it's going well, and then all of a sudden there's that gut punch and you're like, but now what's going to happen? In the sports movies, it's the team, the ragtag group of kids that's brought together with the new coach, and they start practicing, and they start getting some wins, and everything's going great, and then of course they face, you know, the championship team in the league, and they get absolutely destroyed, and it's like this moment of, oh, how are we ever going to beat them? Or in the romantic comedy, which is my favorite genre, there's the geek, and they're starting to build some confidence. Somebody's showing them how to be cool so that they can ask out that guy or girl that they've had a crush on. And when they finally build up that confidence to go ask them to the dance, once you know it, that's as somebody else is swooping in and giving them that kiss at the locker or asking them to the dance right in front of the main character, and they're completely heartbroken. How will they ever move on? In the adventure story, there's always that moment where the heroes are like so close to reaching their goal right before it's swiped away from in front of them. And then they have to go the rest of the movie chasing whatever it is that they were after. And we see this common narrative, this common storyline through movies because how boring would it be If at the beginning of the movie everything started going well and people were moving towards their goal of winning the game or getting the girl or finding the prize, and smoothly they just went step by step and they achieved it. Like if that was the movie plot, I think we would all walk out feeling like we hadn't gotten our money's worth. We expect there to be a level of conflict, a level of failure and, you know, having to overcome and grit and perseverance. We expect that in the movies that we watch. But then when it comes to our own lives, we're like, man, why does this hardship have to come into my life? Why can't everything be easy? Why can't I just go step by step and achieve my goals exactly how I expected to? But just like the plot of movies goes, so goes our lives. We have successes And we have failures, and we have to get up from those failures, and we have to move forward. And those failures, I kind of call it in this series, or this message today, how are we going to respond when we hear no? How do we respond when life doesn't go how we planned? When we face that adversity that we weren't anticipating? The story of Exodus has a clear no in chapter 5. Where everything's been going yes, clear, uh, going smoothly with a series of yeses, but then they hear no, and we have to see how are they going to respond. And so, before we get there, a quick recap in our story as we've been marching through Exodus. God has faithfully been multiplying the Israelites, and they have become a great nation in Egypt. It terrified Pharaoh, so he enslaved them, and then he started pushing on them, so they cried out to God. And they said, God, we, you know, they're complaining. They're not complaining. They're groaning. They're crying out. They have this heavy weight of slavery on them. And so God hears their cries. And he calls Moses out of the burning bush. And he gives Moses a plan. And he gives Moses a task. And he says, Moses, I want you to go to Pharaoh. And tell him to let my people come and worship. Slash to come and serve me out in the wilderness. And so that's where we're at. Moses has agreed finally after a lot of pushback. And he is on his way to Egypt. His brother Aaron, God has said, will be his mouthpiece. And so that's where we're at at the very end of Exodus 4, verse 27. If you're in your Bibles and you want to follow along today, that's where we'll be picking up. But what we're about to see is everything is going pretty smoothly in this story right now. There is a series of yeses. First, verse 27 The Lord said to Aaron, go into the wilderness to meet Moses, 
So he met Moses at the mountain of God, and he kissed him. Aaron hears God's call to go meet Moses. Aaron says, yes, I'm going to go. Then Moses told Aaron everything the Lord had sent him to say, and also about all the signs he had commanded him to perform. Again, Aaron hears the entire story that God has given to Moses, and Aaron says, yes, I will do that with you. I will be your mouthpiece. So Moses and Aaron brought together all the elders of the Israelites, and Aaron told them everything the Lord had said to Moses. And he performed the signs before the people. And they believed. So now the elders of Israel hear this message of God's plan to set them free. And the signs and the wonders. And that Pharaoh's going to push back. But God's mighty hand will compel them. And they say, yes, we want that. And when they heard the Lord was concerned about them. And had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshipped. They heard that God said yes to their cries and to their groans for relief. The beginning of this passage, what we see is a series of yeses. And everything is going forward. And now if we put ourselves in their shoes, we've got to say, we know how this feels. Like God heard our cry. And he's going to do something about it. And he's got a plan. And he's going to set us free. And he's sending Moses and Aaron. And they're going to go to Pharaoh. And they're going to tell Pharaoh that we need to go and worship God. And I'm sure right now they were feeling this tall. You know, they were feeling good. Everything was going smoothly. And they were excited that God was going to set them free. And you've been there before. There have been moments in your life, I'm sure, where everything feels like it's going according to plan. You wanted the job and you're interviewed and you got the job. Or you were praying so hard about some health issue and you went to the doctor and you got the news that you were hoping for. You know, when you have those series of good news events that make you feel like you're on the mountaintop. They make you feel like God hears and he's taking care of you. And there's this phrase we often use when this is happening. We say, God is blessing us. And we feel like God's hand and his blessing and his gifts are being given to us. And we feel so good, like nothing can stop us. But we know in our own lives, we don't typically stay there, do we? At some point, life hits. And that's what happens as we get into chapter 5 here of Exodus. After a long series of yeses, they hear their first no. Exodus 5 verses 1 and 2. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go so that they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I don't know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. This is the first no that the Israelites hear and Moses and Aaron hear. And Pharaoh's not quite as excited about this plan to let his slaves go a three-day journey out as Moses and Aaron and the Israelites were about this plan. And so now we're going to see how is Moses going to respond to this first sign of pushback, this first setback. Is he going to wither like a flower? In the sweltering heat? Or is he going to persevere? Verse 3. Then they said, that's Moses and Aaron, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Now let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. Or he may strike us with plagues or with the sword. But the king of Egypt said, Moses and Aaron, why are you taking the people away from their labor? Get back to work. So I applaud Moses. To his credit, he pushed back on Pharaoh. He didn't just take no and then say, oh, I'm sorry. He said, hey, look, if you don't do this, some bad things are going to happen. God might send plagues. And ultimately when he says, and the sword, he's referring to the death. He's already been told that God's going to take the firstborn child of Pharaoh. And so he's kind of foreshadowing that this is what's going to happen, Pharaoh. Let these people go to worship me. That, that word worship means to serve God. But Pharaoh doesn't want his slaves serving God. He wants them serving him. 
You've wasted my time. Get back to work. And you're taking these people away from their work as well. And so the remainder kind of big chunk of verse 5 I'm going to recap for you here. But Pharaoh, after hearing this, decides, you know what? I've made it too easy on the Israelites. We've been providing all the straw for them to make their bricks to build my buildings. No longer. They can get their own straw. But not only that, they have to continue meeting the same quota, making as many bricks and building as fast as they've been building. And so the Israelites now have double duty. They have to go out into the fields to collect the straw and bring it back into the city to build the bricks. But they can't keep up and they can't meet their quotas. Slave drivers don't care. They've been told they have to meet their quota. So they drive them hard. They start beating the foremen and the leaders of the crews. And so the Israelites, they understand they're in an impossible situation. So they think, let's go to Pharaoh. Maybe if we explain our side of the story, he'll understand. He seems like a reasonable guy, I'm sure, right? So they go to Pharaoh and they say, Pharaoh, you're asking us to do all this extra work and saying we have to get as, produce as much as we were doing before. We can't do that. And Pharaoh says, lazy. You're all being so lazy. You must continue to make as many bricks as you were making before. You guys see the squeeze that Pharaoh is putting on the Israelites at this point, right? They thought everything was going well, but this is that punch in the movie where all of a sudden they have this pushback and it's not going according to plan any longer. How are they going to respond? We pick up the story in verse 19 of chapter 5. The Israelite overseers realized they were in trouble. I think that's an understatement. They were between a rock and a hard spot. When they left Pharaoh, they found Moses and Aaron waiting to meet them. And they said, may the Lord look on you and judge you. You have made us obnoxious to Pharaoh and his officials and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. It's pretty clear how they're feeling right now, isn't it? They feel like dead men walking, stuck with these impossible demands of Pharaoh on their backs and absolutely no way to meet the requirements. And they remembered whose fault it was. They put their fingers, I'm sure, firmly in the chest of Moses and Aaron and said, this is your fault. You did this to us. And it's kind of funny, I'm sure that they're thinking, why couldn't you have just left well enough alone where we were slaves, but at least they provided the straw for us? We could do that job. This is the first time that they do this. We're going to see this exact same thing happen in the wilderness later in the book of Numbers, when they're like, oh, the leeks and the cucumbers and the garlic that we had in Egypt. Oh, if only we had that food again. And it was provided to us for free even. So quickly, they want to just snap back and return to how things used to be. The grass was greener on the other side, or they're looking through rose-colored glasses on their circumstances here just days earlier. And what's interesting to me is that at this juncture, it's not that the Israelites haven't already been told what God was going to do. Remember, the verse said that Moses told all the elders exactly what God had told him. And part of that was that Pharaoh was going to push back and that it was going to require God to compel him with an outstretched arm through many powers and signs to move Pharaoh to allow him to let the Israelites go. But for some reason, it's like they forgot that there was going to be that pushback, that this story was going to have a little bit of conflict in it. And at the very first sign of no and hardship, they want to retreat. They feel like this squeeze isn't worth it and this adventure is not one that they want to stay at. This ride's not worth it. They want to get off, essentially. Picking up in verse 22. Moses, let's see what his response is. He returns to the Lord and said, Why, Lord, have you brought trouble on this people? Is this why you sent me? 
ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has brought trouble on this people, and you have not rescued your people at all. So not only are the Israelites complaining that they heard no from Pharaoh, but now Moses is doing the exact same thing. And I hold him even more culpable in this moment. He's the one that met with God at the burning bush. He's the one who again had God tell him, you need to go tell Pharaoh to let these people go. He's having that direct conversation with God. And as soon as the people push back on him, God, why are you having me do this? Why are you creating all this trouble? And what we see in that very last phrase, I think, shows us the doubt that's creeping into Moses' heart. When he says, and you have not rescued your people at all. God, you're not holding up your end of the bargain. You're the one who said that you were going to set them free. And I don't see you doing that at all, God. It's almost like he's starting to point the finger at God. The Israelites pointed at him, and now he's putting his finger in God's chest and saying, you haven't started to set these people free at all, God. And now before we look at how God responds, I think we have to take a hard look at ourselves for a moment. How would we have responded if we were in the Israelites' shoes or in Moses' shoes? Do we trust God fully even when adversity comes our way as a result of following Jesus? You know, we're excited when we feel like the Spirit of God prompts us to go say something to somebody or to pick up the phone and call them or to get involved in a ministry. That's an exciting time. But then when that ministry doesn't take off or bad things happen in it, Or you make that phone call and somebody kind of pushes back and says, well, why are you talking to me about this? We quickly sometimes maybe wither and say, God, why did you prompt me to do this? It's not going how I anticipated it would go. Or perhaps as soon as our comfort is compromised, do we want to run back to the safety of our old habits? You know, we start to say, I'm going to live differently for you, God. I'm going to start giving to the church. I'm going to start tithing. And then there's a pinch financially. And we instantly say, whoa, whoa, i got to stop what I was doing. I can't give to the church generously. I've got to hold this for myself. When there's pushback, we're, we're kinda, we can be like the Israelites, can't we, sometimes? We quickly want to go back. We want to retreat. We don't like the discomfort. We don't like the pain. Are we willing to keep walking the path He calls us to even when it's not easy? Even when it feels like the blessings have been removed? Or are we only doing it for the goodness, the good things, the blessings, the easy life? Have we believed the lie that any time life gets harder for us or our comforts are removed, that we must have done something wrong? Or worse yet, that God isn't good because He's allowing us to suffer? All of these are questions that we need to wrestle with when we respond to hearing no in our lives. So let's see how God responds to this. Everything went good, and then they heard no, and then the Israelites went to Moses and Aaron and said, this is your fault. So Moses went to God and said, this is your fault. Let's see what God says. Chapter 6, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Because of my mighty hand, he will let them go. Because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of his country. So the first thing God does is he reiterates the promise. Clearly, you all have forgotten what I continue to tell you. He is going to let them go. And in fact, he is going to be the one to drive them out. Verse 2, God also said to Moses, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. This is like the third or fourth time that God points back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob with Moses. You see, this is really important to God. I also established my covenant with them. To give them the land of Canaan where they resided as foreigners. So the next thing we see is God is tying his action back 
to the covenant he made over 400 years ago to Abraham. God isn't, this isn't some new God who's shown up on the scene who can't be trusted, but this is the God who showed up to their forefathers. This is the God who gave Abraham a child at 100 years of age. And he's saying, I made a promise to him, and yes, it didn't happen in the time frame he expected it to, but I came through. And yes, I made this promise to you all, and maybe it's not in the time frame you expected, but I will follow through. Verse 5, moreover, I have heard the groaning of the Israelites, and I have remembered my covenant. He makes sure to remind them all why he is engaging, because he is a God who hears. We talked about that when we read through Exodus 1. He's not a God far away and removed from our plight. He hears us when we cry out to him. He hears us when we pray. He heard them. And that's why he is stepping in. Therefore, verse 6, Say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. And I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. Do you see all the action words described here? I put them in orange, these verbs. That God will bring them. He will free them. He will redeem them. He will give them. God is telling Moses to remind them of all the good things that he has promised for them. That he is about to do for them behind the scenes. He's bringing it to fruition exactly as he, as he planned. And he's trying to encourage them right now to hold on to the hope. Like he told them how it was going to go. And then at the first sign of pushback, they're like, whoa, 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 I don't know if I can trust you, God. So he's reminding them, I'm, look at what I'm about to do. Just hold on. Hold on. It's going to be worth it. Verse 9. This is where it gets a bit sad. Moses reported this to the Israelites. But they did not listen to him because of their discouragement and harsh labor. It's such a sad conclusion to the Lord's message. He's this cheerleader who's trying to say, look, you can trust me. You know who I am. I'm going to come through for you. I've got the power to do it. And they wouldn't even listen to the message because of their discouragement. They didn't even want to hear what Moses had to say. They allowed their discomfort and their suffering to shape how they viewed God, to shape how they looked at their circumstances. They were essentially throwing themselves a pity party. They were digging in deeply into all their woes, and that's what they wanted to focus on, the bad things, the troubles, the trials, that now I'm being beaten for no fault of my own rather than looking at what God has in store for them. They took their eyes off of the promise and they were putting it on their circumstances and their trials. And they were plugging up their ears. I don't even want to hear you, Moses. I don't even want to listen. I'm done. Then the Lord said to Moses, let's see how Moses responds here. Go tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the Israelites go out of this country. But Moses said to the Lord, If the Israelites will not listen to me, why would Pharaoh listen to me, since I speak with faltering lips? So the Israelites come out looking pretty bad, but Moses in this scene looks even worse. He goes straight back to the excuses that he was throwing earlier to God at the burning bush. God, I told you they wouldn't listen to me. And if they won't listen to me, why would I expect Pharaoh to listen to me? Remember, God, this is because of my faltering, faltering lips. This is because I don't talk good. 
essentially. He's going back to that. Nothing in this story up to this point has anything to do with Moses' ability to speak eloquently. And yet, as soon as there's this pushback, he goes back to those initial insecurities. God, remember I told you I didn't want to do this. I told you I wasn't the one. His fears, his failings, his disbelief in himself, that all rises to the top right here. And he says, God, see, they don't listen to me. Pharaoh won't listen to me. I'm not the guy. And I think the common ground in these responses between the Israelites and Moses are that both of them so quickly forgot who God is. They doubted that he was good and that he was going to be good to fulfill that promise. What's crucial for us to see is how quickly this doubt took root in their lives and completely changed their response to God. When things were going good and everybody was saying yes, they were all excited and they bowed down and they worshipped. God, thank you, you're going to set us free. The plan didn't change. Their circumstances did. What they saw right in front of them changed. And even though God was saying, look, guys, I told you what this plan was going to be. The discomfort came in. Things got tough. And I don't want to downplay being beaten for a situation that you can't control is no good at all. But they instantly turn from God's promise and they say, we just want to go back to the way things used to be. The same with Moses. He's probably thinking, God, I told you I couldn't do this. You should have just left me in the wilderness tending my sheep. They both have slidden back into their old ways of thinking their old excuses. And meanwhile, God is screaming at them. He's saying, guys, just trust me. He's trying to say, I am good. I am faithful. I want what's best for you. I hear your cries. I'm not in this to just let you suffer. But you can't see what I'm doing behind the scenes. You don't know the plan I have in store. That ultimately you're going to walk out of here with all the gold and silver of the Egyptians. You're going to plunder them on the way out. They can't see God's whole plan. They only see a little bit in front of them. And they don't believe it. I came across a YouTube video today. Or not today, Friday that I thought, this is perfect. A YouTuber makes videos all the time of doing farm chores around and stuff in his woods. That's the type of stuff I watch. Yes, you can judge me. And he was doing this video and he said, you know, so often after I make a video, everybody leaves in the comments, why did you do it this way? You should have done it that way. Why did you use this tool for the job when I know you've got that tool? You should have taken this off your tractor, put that on your tractor, and set it up and done this. That wasn't safe. And he said, look, guys, you don't know when I'm putting together a video what's happened in my day, how, you know, soft the ground is. Can I have that heavy of a tractor? If I only have an hour, is it worth me to change the implement out if I'm only going to do one small task? He said, you don't know everything behind the scenes. You simply have to trust that I know what I'm doing and I have a reason for why I'm doing it on video the way I'm doing it. Do you hear that? <laughs> I left a comment. I said, I quoted that. I said, you know, typed in quotes, if you knew what I was doing, you'd know why I did it. <laughs> I wrote, and God nodded in agreement. Right? If we knew what God was doing above us, We'd say, okay, God, now I understand. But we don't. So sometimes we just see the garbage in front of us. And we have to sit in that moment, and we have to trust. And we have to believe. And we have to say, God, even though this does not look like what I had envisioned, I'm going to trust you. I'm not going to be like the Israelites and complain. I'm not going to throw a pity party. I'm not going to say, I wish... I could just go back and not listen to you and not follow you, God. I am going to stay on the path that you've called me to, even though it may cause me pain, 
even though it may put trials in my life, even though people may not respond to the message the way that I hope that they will, I will continue and I will be faithful because I can't see everything that you see. And so as we turn ourselves, the story back on ourselves, we have to ask, how are we going to respond when we hear no? When our life experiences stop going up and to the right, how will we respond? There's a few common responses. A few of them are traps. You see, there's some Christians that they believe that if you follow Jesus, life should always be roses and butterflies. It should always be good. There's a huge part of Christian bookstores that basically teach this. If you pray enough, if you believe enough, then you'll, God will always do good for you and you will always have blessings. And that sounds really amazing. Like, I want that. I want the easy life. Let's just read and pray and always have the easy life. But many of us have been Christians for a very long time and we know that's not how it works. Just because you follow God and you pray and you try to do the right thing does not mean that you'll never have difficulty in your life. The problem is, if that's your belief in Christianity, if you have a shallow Christianity there, when you hit the difficulties, you'll be just like the Israelites and you'll want to hit the eject button. You'll want to drop your faith and say, whoa, 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 this is not what I signed up for. I thought when I put my faith in Jesus, everything was good to me. But that's a faith that can't withstand the trials and the heat of life. There's other Christians that have a misunderstanding of how blessings work. And they would say, when life is going well for me, it means God is happy. And when life is going bad, it means I must have some sin in my life or I did something to displease God. And so then he's upset with me and that's why life is getting hard. These same Christians, when they see bad things happening to other people, might say, well, is there something in your own life that you've done why God's upset with you? Don't say that. That's a bad theology. That's not how it works. Every gift we receive from God is by His grace. It is unearned. It is undeserved. And we thank God for it. But the trials and the troubles are not God throwing things at us because He's angry with us. They're part of life. They're part of the sinful nature of this world. And sometimes, yes, God allows us to sit in those moments. Because of his wisdom, he sees that he's not going to rescue us from those the way that we'd like to be rescued immediately. And we have to trust God. We don't say, God, you must be mad at me. We say, God, I need you to help me get through this. Mature Christians understand that everything we get is from God. And so we don't have to worry about God being happy with us or mad at us. Our circumstances do not dictate anything about our status with God. Because here's the big idea. Sometimes God is up to something beyond what we can ever understand. Sometimes he's doing something that we see the trials. We see Pharaoh saying, you need to keep making the same quota of bricks and I'm not going to provide straw. And we look at that and say, God, why are you mad at me? And God's saying, this is my plan to set you free and to pillage them on the way out. God is doing something different to get from point A to point B than what we might imagine. And it's probably not the path that we would have chosen when it creates challenges for us, but it doesn't mean that he's not to be trusted. So what are we going to do in that situation? Are we going to respond with complaining and doubt? Or are we going to do like the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans chapter 5, verse 3 through 4? Not only that, he writes, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. Like I've said, many Christians are like the Israelites, and they see suffering as this terrible thing to be avoided at all costs. But we don't see then how God might redeem the suffering, how He might use it to actually build us and grow us and develop us 
into something better. They don't understand this verse that God can use our suffering to produce endurance. And that endurance to produce character, godliness. Use that godliness to produce hope. You see, we don't have to wallow in our challenges, throwing this pity party feeling like God has abandoned us. In fact, our circumstances should really have no bearing on how we view God. What, the truth that we have to understand is that no matter what, God is with us. He's always with you. When life is going well, He's with you, celebrating in that victory. And when life is going terrible, He's right beside you in the mess. He hasn't abandoned you, and that's why life is hard. He's right beside you going through it, saying, trust me, follow me, I'll get you through this. Through all the ups and downs of your life story, God is with you through all of it. Even when your life doesn't look like it's going up and to the right, you can trust that God has guaranteed where your life is going to end up. Ultimately, He's going to bring you home. He's going to bring you into His presence. That's where all of life is going to end up. And all the rest is simply dressing. Would you bow your heads with me as we pray? Heavenly Father, <laughs> I thank you for this message that's a challenge for us. We want things to be easy. We want things to go our way. 